Now, um, first of all, let's, let's uh, clear something. In, in the media, in the West, and uh, amongst uh, leading politicians in Western imperialism, in Britain, in the United States, and so on, there is a constant uh, anti-Chinese campaign. China is bad. China is doing all these bad things, which they're obviously also doing themselves. But uh, never mind, China is very bad. China is uh, scheming and manipulating, is apparently paying some, uh, some uh, people in Westminster to influence politicians, as if this never happens in this country, and uh, stuff like that. Now, this is not an anti-China talk. Uh, but this is a communist uh, attempt to understand what China is and what, China, what, what role does China play in world uh, relations. We are internationalists and we do not uh, support our own uh, uh, ruling class. We do not defend the rights of our own imperialist uh, ruling class. We want to analyze the situation from the point of view of the interests of the working class. The working class in China, the working class in the world. It is important for communists to understand world relations and where this uh, comes from. Now, um, the share, the share of the of the private sector. I'm, I'm trying to use uh, Chinese official figures, but some of these figures need to be taken. No, I wouldn't say with a pinch of salt, but they need to be understood because sometimes the definitions of what is a privately owned company or a mixed company or a state company is a bit complicated uh, and, and doesn't necessarily correspond to what we will uh, normally understand. But according to Chinese official figures, uh, the private sector defined restrictively as firms with less than 10% state participation in the first half of 2023 was about 40% of GDP. This is one uh, uh, figure that you can uh, look at. Uh, but this was uh, the lowest that this figure was since 2019. During the pandemic and so on, uh, private sector has decreased a little bit and the state sector has uh, correspondingly increased. But, uh, but um, the private sector actually uh, reached the, the, the private sector reached a peak of 55% of GDP around, uh, around 2021. But I think there's not just the share, the, the, the strength, the weight of the private sector, but also it's important to look at the, the, the arrow. Where's the arrow pointing? What's the direction of the, of the process? In 2010, the private sector defined in this way was only 8% of the uh, of the GDP and is now 40 has been 50 percent uh, uh, and so on according to also official figures 80 percent of the industrial workforce i.e. workers who work specifically in industry 80 percent of the industrial workforce is in the private uh, sector the private sector contributes 50 percent of exports and exports are obviously an important part of the Chinese economy more so than in some other capitalist uh, countries. In 2011, i.e. when this process was still uh, at the beginning or starting, or had started maybe 10 years uh, earlier or, or so, um, the, the Chinese minister, the, the and spokesman for the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, he said, after 30 years of reform and opening up, China has completed the transformation from a planned economy to a market economy. This was the official position of the Chinese state back in 2010. You also have to take this with a, with a slight pinch of salt because at that time they were, they were in negotiations about the joining the WTO and whether, whether China should be, the Chinese economy should be considered a planned economy or not and so on for other reasons. But that gives you an idea of what the situation uh, is. I will say that for some years now, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it cannot be contested that the Chinese state defends and promotes capitalist property relations. Yes, the chi China is a capitalist country in which the state plays a big role in the economy. This is because of its history and other factors, i.e. coming from a planned economy onto a, a capitalist uh, economy. But nevertheless, 
the state sector is used in order to defend and, and promote and foster capitalist property uh, relations. And what dominates in uh, China is not economic planning, but rather uh, the capitalist profit, private profit uh, uh, motive. And this is uh, how, how, the, um, how, the, how the capitalist economy works in, uh, in China. This process, as I said, took over 30 years. And uh, uh, another interesting factor is that is the Chinese capital abroad, i.e. Chinese capitalists from other countries, played a big role in the development of capitalism in, uh, in China. They were the first ones to invest in private uh, companies, uh, bring plants into China and, and so on. But obviously, international capital also played a big role. Uh, and this was a big part of what in the 1990s was called the process of globalization, the integration of, of China into the capitalist uh, market, massive investment by Western companies in China, which they originally used as a source of cheap labor. This is what they were looking for. They were looking for uh, cheap labor in order to be able to produce cheaply. And uh, as an aside, this displayed a big role for, for the whole period of time in keeping inflation down in the advanced capitalist uh, countries. Uh, and this was an important uh, part of, of the political and economic situation in the 1990s and, and beyond. Now, uh, a question that can be asked, is a legitimate question, is how, how, how is it possible that uh, a backward-dominated country, as China was before the Chinese Revolution in 1949, has now become a powerful part of the world economy, a powerful developed uh, capitalist uh, economy? Uh, if, if, you, if you read uh, Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, it says that the, the, the national bourgeois in uh, dominated countries, in backward capitalist countries, in the epoch of imperialism, cannot play a progressive role and cannot uh, carry out the, the tasks of the, of, the, of the bourgeois revolution, the national democratic revolution. But China is different because in China is not the capitalist class, the Chinese bourgeois, which has carried out those uh, tasks, but it was the Chinese revolution which abolished capitalism and went a long way in sol solving the national democratic tasks in China, which are mainly <clears throat> the agrarian uh, reform with the expropriation of landlordism and, the, and the, the question of national unification and national uh, sovereignty. China in 1990, in 2000, was not a backward uh, country dominated by uh, imperialism, it was an independent uh, uh, country where many of the tasks of the National Democratic Revolution had been solved uh, decades uh, earlier. And this was the basis on which capitalist development started in uh, China. On top of this, there were, other, uh, there were other elements to this, the fact that there was a strong state there was uh, universal uh, education, high, high level of uh, education and cultural uh, level, allowed China to catch up with, uh, with a number of uh, advanced technologies and, and so on. China as well has not only become a capitalist uh, country, it's become a capitalist country that's changed its character in, in the international division of labor. It was originally, as I said, a, a country dominated by cheap labor and the export of uh, cheap commodities toys, textiles, uh, cheap electronic goods, and so on. But it is now no longer that, or, or those sectors, those features of the capitalist uh, economy that China was maybe 20 years ago, no, are no longer dominant in China, I would, uh, I would argue. Uh, right now, China has moved towards a higher technology and higher wages uh, economy. The average let me get this right. I think it's either the average or the median. Anyway, the average wage in China today is about $1,300. That disguises a lot of uh, regional disparities, but that will make Chinese workers' wages higher than wages, for instance, in Albania, in Romania, in Mexico, and in other countries where capitalists go looking for, uh, looking for uh, cheap labor. And that creates a number of uh, consequences. There are now some companies, for different reasons, but one reason is wages, that are moving away from China or away from the co coastal areas that are more economically developed into uh, cheaper labor areas or into other cheaper labor economies in uh, Asia or into other cheaper labor economies that are closer to the capitalist markets these uh, companies 
want to want to serve and also sorry yeah 1300 a month uh -huh. 1300 dollars a month and then uh, Chinese uh, has adopted the Chinese economy has adopted very advanced technologies in some sectors Chinese technology is ahead of other capitalist imperialist uh, countries just to give one example uh, the, the you know for instance about um, electronic uh, sorry electric uh, vehicles which is a, which is a growing sector of the capitalist uh, economy and electric vehicles are no longer I'm not an engineer by any stretch of imagination, but what I understand is that the most important thing in an elect electric vehicle is not so much the engine, but the battery, the battery and, 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 the, and the range that this battery might have and so on. Now, uh, there is a Chinese company called CAT, 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 CATL. This is the largest maker of uh, electric vehicle batteries in the world and uh, controls 34% of the world's market for, uh, for electric vehicle batteries. And it's well ahead of any other company and supplies all the major, major car manufacturers in the world, including Tesla, Ford, uh, Volvo, which is obviously no longer a Swedish uh, multinational, but a multinational that has now been bought, bought off by a Chinese uh, capital and so on. Just to give you one uh, example. And how, how has China achieved that? Well, by the traditional methods of a capitalist uh, country, by uh, stealing technology, by sending uh, thousands of uh, students to study in the most prestigious universities in uh, Britain, in the United States, to try to uh, invest a lot of money in research and development uh, campuses, and basically by investing in a series of sectors that they think are sectors that are the future of capitalist uh, economy, and therefore gaining an advantage over other countries. This is also, I will say, part of the combined and uneven uh, development. A, a formerly backward economy can uh, jump ahead in certain sectors. China, for instance, has an advantage that it never had a massive car manufacturing, uh, traditional fuel car manufacturing uh, industry as the West has. And therefore, the transition to electric vehicles is much uh, faster. And this can be replicated in many other, in many other sectors of the economy. Its role in the world, China's role in the world, has also changed. And I will argue that China uh, is playing an imperialist role in the world uh, economy and in world uh, relations. Now, what does imperialism mean? Uh, imperialism, wh when we talk about imperialism from a communist point of view, we, we don't mean the general common sense understanding of imperialism as, as in an aggressive foreign policy, military invasions, and so on. That is part of imperialism. But if you look at Lenin's definition of uh, imperialism, the classic features that Lenin describes in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of uh, Capitalism, these are, try to summarize, uh, the concentration of production and capital developed to such a high stage that it creates monopolies, which play a decisive role in the economic life. Number two, the merging of banking capital with industrial capital and the creation of finance capital. Number three, the export of capital is distinguished from the export of commodities, which acquires an exceptional importance. Four, the formation of international monopolist capitalist associations, which share the world amongst themselves. And number five, the territorial division of the world amongst the biggest capitalist powers becomes complete. This, this is Lenin's definition of, uh, cap of imperialism, the imperialist stage of capitalism. You will see that Lenin is talking about a world system. He's not trying to, to define one country by ticking five uh, boxes. This is, this is what he describes as a world system, the division of the world between the biggest capitalist uh, powers. I will argue that uh, China fulfills all of this in one degree or another, all of these uh, different uh, conditions and is now part of the world imperialist system. First of all, as I said, uh, first of all, China is dominated by big monopolies. Uh, Chinese companies are huge, and uh, these huge companies dominate a, a very large percentage of the total of the Chinese economy. Just to give you one example, and these monopolies have a projection in the world economy. Just to give you a, an indication, a total of 135 Chinese companies figure in the Forbes 500 uh, list of the biggest companies in the world, 135. Uh, 
uh, uh, the United States and Japan. The United States has 136, Japan has 41 in the list. So uh, China has more or less the same number of huge companies in this 500 top, uh, top list. And, uh, and, uh, and this has now been the case for some years. I'm talking about the Forbes 500 list for the year 2023. Uh, finance also dominates uh, the Chinese economy and there's a fusion between finance capital and industrial capital that's very marked in China. Uh, the four largest banks in the world, there's different ways of uh, measuring size. It's, uh, say, in the uh, uh, amount of deposits, um, value of capitalization, number of workers. But by one measure, at least, China possesses the four largest banks in the world. That are the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the China Construction Bank, the Bank of China, and the Agricultural Bank of China. They, these are the four largest banks in the world, and they play a, a big role in China's economy. They also play a big role in the world uh, uh, economy. China also exports capital uh, for some time now. This has been a process. If you look at the graph of the Chinese export of capitals, it goes like this. Sorry, it goes like this. <laughs> up, 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 up. From, from approximately 2005, 2000, particularly after 2010, and is now very, very high. Of course, there are certain things that have been happening in the last two or three years, the COVID pandemic, the, the lockdown and all of this, which have distorted some the disruption of world, world trade supply chains and so on. This has disrupted some of these uh, patterns. But up until that point, the, the curve was very upwards. Just to give you an indication. Oh, here it is. Um, China's outgo outgoing foreign direct investment began to rise after 2000. The annual flow of China's outward foreign investment jumped from 2.7 million, sorry, 2.7 billion US dollars in, in 2002 to 196 billion, say, let's call it 200, 200 billion US dollars in 2016. That's in, in the space of about uh, 15 uh, years. It uh, multiplied by 100, by 100. I'm not a maths expert, as you can uh, see, but it seems to me that this is multiplication by 100. I'll just give you some other figures. These are, these are figures of the top 10 countries and regions in the world as sources of outward foreign direct investment stock and annual flow, right? So in... Uh, in the, and this is figures for 2015, right? Uh, and the source is the, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. Uh, in 2015, in 2015, in terms of stock, i.e. accumulated foreign direct uh, investment, the USA was at the top with 23% share of the global foreign direct investment stock. Uh, China, was, China was number eight at only 4.4%. But Hong Kong uh, was, which is uh, accounted separately, was fourth at 5.9%. In terms of total stock, i.e. The, the, the accumulated in foreign direct investment over a period of time at the point of 2015. But in terms of flow, i.e. the money that goes out every year as a foreign direct uh, investment, uh, China, uh, the US in 2015 was still number one with 20% of, of, of share of the total global foreign direct uh, investment flow, China was number two with 10%, i.e. half of China, half of the United States, sorry. And Hong Kong was number nine with 3.7%. If you add Hong Kong to China, that makes about 13, 13.7, 13.6%, which is, which is not that far from the outward fo foreign direct investment for the United States at that point in 2015. Of course, foreign direct investment is a very uh, misguiding category. Some of this money is then stashed in, uh, in uh, tax havens in the Cayman, Cayman Islands, in the Seychelles, or in other tax havens like this. But quite a lot of this does go into foreign direct investment. 
mergers and acquisitions. We have seen uh, China pursuing very aggressively. Perhaps aggressively is not the right word. It's the word the Western imperialists will, will use. But uh, very, um, uh, very, what's another word for aggressive that's not so... Uh, very, uh, yeah, very strongly promoting uh, investment of Chinese companies in, in buying and investing in other, in other countries, in all sorts of things, which I will go in, into in a minute. China's foreign aid expenditure. This is also another form of, uh, of imperialism, because we know foreign aid is not really foreign aid. It's about getting political clout. It's about getting uh, countries dependent on your foreign aid and so on. Foreign aid, it was a very small uh, amount in uh, China, but uh, it's growing very fast. Uh, uh, the, the last figure I could find was for 2003. This is a long time ago. But at that time, China was using in foreign aid 2.3 billion US dollars. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. It says here, from 600 million in, two, in 2003 to 2.3 billion in 2016. Now, 2.3 billion puts China in the range of medium-sized capitalist countries like, say, Belgium, Australia, in terms of spending in foreign uh, aid, in inverted commas. China's... Um, yes, I think these are the figures for, for export of capital. I will go a bit more into this in a minute. Uh, monopolies, we already said. Finance, we already said. And then finally, there's this question of the division, division of the world between the main imperialist uh, powers. And China is now part of this. It's quite clearly part of this. If you, you probably heard of the Road and Belt uh, Initiative, also known as the New Silk uh, Road, what does that mean? China is uh, attempting to spend a lot of money into doing what? Into securing shipping and trading uh, lanes for its uh, export products. Trade, uh, trading routes, also securing sources of energy and raw materials for its uh, hungry uh, industrial uh, development, and also securing fields of, of uh, investment and chaining a whole number of countries to its area of influence through the export of uh, capital, through investment, and, uh, and uh, so on. And this, quite clearly, has led China into an open conflict with the United States. And we can see that on many different uh, aspects. There's now the beginning or elements of a trade war between China and the United States, which started uh, at the time of the Trump presidency, but which has continued with the Biden uh, administration. It's not, it's not a partisan policy. It's a capitalist ruling class of the United States policy. And you have seen incidents of this. For instance, the United States lobbied Britain very strongly not to allow Huawei into the bidding for 5G infrastructure contracts. And why is this? Because right now uh, fi uh, Huawei, which my many of you might think as a, as a maker of uh, cheap uh, telephones, mobile phones, Huawei is now one of the main players in 5G infrastructure in the world. This is a, develop a, a very uh, uh, sharp development of, of technology, and China is at the top in, uh, in this uh, technology. And there's other cases of this. China, uh, uh, United States is lobbying Brazil very hard not to allow Huawei in. Uh, was it Canada arrested some Huawei uh, executives? And all of this is, is nothing to do with industrial spionage or worrying about uh, the, the white hole mobile phones being listened to in, into by uh, China. There might be an element of that, but, but it's basically the competition between different capitalist uh, companies. And incidentally, this also proves another point. There are some people um, 20 years ago, so they were arguing, arguing, ar arguing that uh, imperialism didn't exist anymore, that what we had was empire, a one world conglomerate of uh, companies that dominate. No, no, no. Imperialism does exist and is divided in between different warring and competing imperialist powers. And China defends the interests of Huawei and the United States defends the interests of Boeing and uh, the European Union defends the interests of Airbus in the world uh, market by any means uh, uh, necessary that they are available at their disposal. Now, um, okay, this as I said brings brings uh, China into conflict with the United States. This is very uh, clear. And this conflict is manifested on many different uh, fields. Right now, China, 
Right now, China is not using military power to uh, secure its imperialist interests so far, I will add. Uh, and that makes some people say, oh, but the Chinese investment in Africa is friendly investment. It's not like imperialists uh, that organize military coups and uh, so on, and they send uh, gunboats and this and that. Uh, yeah, that is true, but that doesn't make Chinese investment of a different characteristic as imperialist investment from other, from other countries. China is not using military power to, um, to exercise its imperialist interest abroad because it's not able to yet, right? Uh, China is still much weaker than the United States in military terms, though it's catching up in a whole number of uh, areas. The United States has built its military power all, all around the world for a very long period of time and so on. So China is using mainly finance, diplomacy, and, uh, and so on. However, it has to be said that China has already built a military base in Djibouti. Djibouti is obviously a very important choke point for international uh, trade at the, at the mouth of the, of the Red Sea. And uh, several of the harbors that are being built or have been built through the Road and Belt Initiative have a dual uh, or potentially have a dual military civilian uh, use. Part of this is US propaganda, but part of this is also uh, potentially true. And the classic pattern is the following for Chinese foreign, uh, for foreign investment in different countries. Chinese, the Ch a, Ch a Chinese state-owned bank lends money to country A. Country A then uses this money in order to carry out some big infrastructure projects, uh, an electro uh, generating uh, power dam, uh, hydroelectrical uh, power station, uh, railway, uh, the, the improvement of the capacity of a harbor to uh, offer service to uh, bigger uh, ship, ships and so on. And then this infrastructure project is usually carried out by Chinese infrastructure companies, Chinese civil construction, railway construction companies. Chinese companies then operate this set uh, infrastructure project. For instance, Chinese railway company uh, operates the, rail the railway, a Chinese uh, harbor, a Ch Chinese uh, Costco, for instance, or other big uh, Chinese harbor companies take over. And then, in exchange for this uh, investment, which is in the form of a loan, which means this country is now in debt with uh, China, uh, in exchange for this, this uh, China gets uh, rights to the exploitation of uh, minerals or other natural resources, uh, preferential trading uh, in uh, soybeans or meat uh, and other things like this. And these infrastructure projects, interestingly, link the raw materials that this country uh, possesses to harbors from which they're going to be shipped to, uh, to China. Uh, these projects are then put as collateral for this debt. If this country, as it often happens, defaults on its debt, then the Chinese get full control of these infrastructures that have been uh, built. And this all builds debt and political leverage and creates a relationship which cannot be described as uh, in any other way that there's the, between an imperialist country and a dominated uh, country. And this is happening, this is happening everywhere. It's happening in the whole of Africa, in Latin America, in many Asian countries. And I can give you many, many uh, examples. For instance, amongst other things, uh, China has developed a string of investments in harbors around the world that they think are crucial for their shipping uh, lanes. And if you look at the map, you, you will be surprised. I was surprised when I looked at the, at the map. Let, let's put it this way. I don't know if you're going to be surprised or not. But China has now control or investment. In some cases, it's a small investment, 10% share, 30% share. In other cases, it's a dominant uh, position in, uh, in all the shipping main shipping lanes around the world. The, the Malacca Straits, M Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. Then obviously they have this big harbor in uh, Sri Lanka. Then there's the Wadar uh, Harbor that they built in uh, Pakistan, which also means that there's going to be a, a land connecting uh, route through uh, Central uh, Asia. Incidentally, all of this also bypasses China, which is a traditional uh, enemy of uh, of bypasses India, 
is a traditional enemy of China in the world uh, relations. And then from Wadar, you go to Djibouti, the, the, the harbor that I mentioned before, which is uh, built and owned by a Chinese company. Then on the other side of the, of the, of the Red Sea, the mouth of the Red Sea, there's the, uh, the port of Aden, which is also invested by the Chinese. On the Mediterranean side, you have Port Said in uh, Egypt, uh, in the mouth of the Suez Canal. The Haifa Harbor in uh, Israel. Then you go to the port of Piraeus in uh, Greece, which is wholly owned by a Chinese company, Costco. Then you go to some of the harbors in the north of uh, Italy, the harbor in uh, Valencia in Spain, the port, I think it's called the Euro, Europort in Algiers in uh, Morocco. Then you go all the way up to the port of uh, Bilbao, the port of a uh, number of ports in uh, France, but also Dunkirk, uh, uh, Nikolaev, which is now obviously not very useful. Uh, but uh, they have investments like this. And then also on the Pacific uh, side, uh, China has investments in the port of Los Angeles and the port of Seattle, the two, uh, two of the biggest ports of, uh, of the Pacific uh, coast, and is now building a, a port in a harbor, a new harbor in um, Chancay in, um, in Peru, which is going to cut the, the time that... Uh, the trading takes between China and South America by five to 10 uh, days. So that, that just gives you an idea of what they're trying to do. They're trying to secure shipping and trading uh, uh, routes, which is, which is uh, it's not an evil thing. It's uh, you know, plotting and scheming is, is the behavior of an imperialist country that wants to secure its interests in the, in the, in the world. I'll just give you one, one example, for instance, in Zambia, Zambia is a landlocked country in, in southern uh, uh, Africa, which is very rich in copper. So the Chinese have invested. They have uh, rights for uh, the extraction of uh, copper in uh, Zambia. Zambia is now heavily indebted to, uh, to Zambia is heavily indebted to China. The uh, Chinese have, n have now built and renovated a railway line that connects uh, the mines in um, the mines in Zambia to the Dar es Salaam uh, harbor in Tanzania uh, in order to extract copper, also other, other important minerals for the development of new technologies. And, uh, and guess what? The Chinese are building the Tazara railway line, which will connect, uh, sorry, the Tazara railway line is the other one that I just uh, mentioned, but they're building another um, a, a series of other railways that will connect uh, the, the Indic Ocean uh, coast with uh, the Congo, uh, one, one that goes through, uh, that connects Rwanda, Malawi, Burundi with uh, Uganda, another one that connects Kenya with uh, Djibouti and, and so on. The idea of this is to extract this, uh, to, to, to provide a proper uh, fast uh, way of extracting <laughs> these raw materials from these important uh, areas of the world. Uh, Nairobi to Mombasa, Addis Ababa to Djibouti, and there are many other examples like this. In Ecuador, is heavily indebted uh, with uh, China, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, etc. The same thing is happening in the whole of, of South America. So, uh, now, now China has become the main, about two years ago, China became the main trading partner for the whole of South America. And this is quite damaging from the point of view of the interest of U.S. imperialism. U.S. imperialism has always, for 200 years, about 200 years ago, this year, uh, the Monroe Doctrine was uh, enunciated, and the Monroe Doctrine says America for the Americans, which basically means the, U the America is the backyard of U.S. imperialism, and no other imperialist powers will, will be allowed to have any say in, uh, in the whole of America. Well, now you have China, which is the main trading partner with the whole of South America, particularly countries like uh, Chile, Argentina, uh, um, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, and Bolivia. Uh, all these countries, what do they, what, what's, the, what's the character of this trade with, uh, with China? The character of this trade is that China purchases raw materials, copper, beef, pork, oil, gas, lithium, soybeans, contributing, by the way, to the deforestation of whole regions of, uh, of uh, South uh, America, uh, and sells manufactured goods, machinery, transport equipment, manufactured goods and chemicals are the main items 
the China exports. At the same time, China invests money in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America through foreign direct investment. China has bought uh, the electricity grid in many of the Brazilian uh, states. Uh, and China, Chinese companies, Chinese privately owned car companies, electric vehicle companies, BYD, and what's the other one? Uh, Great Wall Motors have now bought two big plants, car plants in Brazil, one that was formerly owned by Ford and one that was formerly owned by, um, was it Volkswagen or General Motors? I'm not totally sure. Two, two Western imperialist companies have left Brazil and this has been taken over now by two Chinese companies that are gonna build uh, electric vehicles. Incidentally, the world's largest manufacturer of uh, electric vehicles is now BYD, although these figures are a bit of a trick because BYD produces both pure electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles, while Tesla, which is the main competitor, produces only electric uh, uh, vehicles. So it's not, it's not a same by same comparison, but it's, it's up there. Um, okay, so, so I'd say that this demonstrates the fact that China is an imperialist, uh, imperialist uh, country, and this has certain consequences and certain uh, uh, implications. Some people say that this is a positive feature. The role that China plays in the world economy is a positive feature because this means that we now have or can hope for a multipolar world that is no longer dominated by US imperialism. And uh, therefore, this is a better thing that uh, the peoples of the world particularly in the oppressed uh, countries, now have a freer uh, room to develop. And, but this is, this is, this is uh, I don't want to use a strong word, but this is, uh, this is completely wrong because there is no advantage for the working class in advanced capitalist countries or in dominated capitalist countries that instead of the world being dominated or mostly dominated by one imperialist country, which wasn't, in any case, wasn't the case before, but, China, but, but the U.S. clearly played a much more dominant role in uh, the past, say, 20 years ago than it plays now. Uh, instead of that, now we have different imperialist powers fighting for control over different countries. This, this doesn't improve the situation of the working uh, people, the poor peasants and the poor people in uh, the oppressed uh, uh, nations of the world. It doesn't. It just means there is more conflict. There are more regional uh, wars between the two of them. If anyone attended the, the talk yesterday about uh, the situation in Africa and, and French imperialism, you can see, you can see that uh, clearly. That, that is not an improvement. The workers of, of the world, their interest is to fight against all imperialist uh, uh, powers, not, not to fight so that different imperialist powers balance each other off. It is true, however, that the fact that uh, China now plays a bigger role in the world economy, allows certain countries around the world to try to balance one power against the other and change slightly their allegiances. I'm coming to, to an end. Um, and change their allegiances. For instance, we have seen a whole number of countries that were in the past very close allies of the United States, or let me rephrase that, they were basically puppets of the United States. They were completely dominated by the United States, countries like Turkey or Saudi Arabia or even Brazil, for instance. They now in the world politics are trying to play a more independent role. It doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia has cut off its links with the uh, United States. No, they're trying to play China off against the United States in order to gain a, a bit of an advantage for themselves. This, this is not beneficial for Saudi Arabian uh, workers. We're still under the yoke of, uh, of a semi-feudal uh, reactionary monarchy. Uh, many of them are foreign uh, immigrant workers in, in conditions of no rights and very low wages and uh, high, high exploitation. But, but this means that Saudi Arabia is able to, for instance, in the conflict in uh, Ukraine, it's clear that Saudi Arabia has been uh, leaning towards helping Russia keep oil prices up and trading with uh, Russia in, uh, in oil. There are other factors in this. The fact that now the United States is almost self-sufficient in terms of uh, oil, which wasn't the case in the past. There's other factors, but clearly, if, if, you, if you were watching the wall this year, you, you realize that there was a peace, a peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran that was brokered by China. 
And this means that uh, the United States are not, no longer playing a dominant role in the Middle East as they were able to play in, uh, in the past. Now, the other thing we need to say is that, uh, is that this, this process has certain limits. We're not saying that China is growing, is growing, its influence in the world is growing, its, uh, its role as an imperialist power is growing, and at some point it will overtake the United States and become the main imperialist power in the world. We're not saying that. Why are we not saying that? Because this process has certain limits, which I think the China's economy is more or less now reached. Uh, China's economy has been for many years invest heavily investing in uh, gross capital formation, i.e. building uh, machinery, factories, industries, and is now facing a classic capitalist crisis of overproduction. It can produce too much still, too many cars and too many of everything they can't sell at any, uh, at any place. And it's a classic uh, uh, crisis of uh, capitalism. It's also a crisis of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Uh, the same amount of investment in machinery and technology in China does no longer produce the same amount of GDP growth as it did in the past. It's still growing, but it is not the same as in the, in the past. And also there are some other factors. There's a factor that the Chinese and the U.S. economy are extremely interconnected. Uh, and therefore, there are, there are U.S. companies in whose interest it is not that there is a trade war. Like, for instance, uh, Foxconn builds, uh, is a huge uh, industrial enterprise in China that builds most of the Apple phones that people use in the, in the West. They are not interested in a trade uh, war, o obviously. And there are many other Western companies that are invested in uh, in China, they're playing a restraining role. And you see from time to time, Western capitalist uh, leaders going to China for a trade conference and so on, trying to, to uh, return to normal diplomatic relations and so on. This is another reason. But finally, but finally uh, the United States, uh, uh, the United States as a, as a world imperialist power, its role has declined, but this decline is still a relative decline. Uh, not, not only is it still the biggest economy in the world, sometimes people say, oh, but China has already overtaken the United States as the biggest economy or will overtake the United States. Yeah, but China has a much bigger population than the United States. This means that the productivity of labor in the United States is still much higher than the, 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 in China overall, because China is also a very un, unequal country. Not the same thing, the coastal areas where most of the capitalist development has taken place, but the areas in the interior were still lagging uh, behind and, and so on. And in terms of military power, the United States is still far ahead. Uh, China has, just to give you an example, China has, I think, two um, aircraft carriers only, and, and the United States has, I can't remember how many, but uh, many, many, many more. And in many other areas, this is, this is the, the case. So, uh, so I think that while this situation obviously leads to more tensions, more um, potential for regional wars and local wars in the, in the world uh, relations, it does not mean that China will overtake the United States anytime uh, soon because China is, is facing up to its own limits. Last, last point I want to make is what is the position of communists in relation to all this? The position of communists is the following. The position of communists is the main enemy of the working class is at home. We are sitting here in the UK or in the United States. Our main enemy, not China, our main enemy is the ruling class in this country. Uh, and, our, and our allies are the workers of the world, including the workers in China. This is the interesting point. The economic development, the development of capitalism in China has created a powerful working class, a working class that has no traditions, uh, no recent traditions of, uh, of uh, struggle. There have been many strikes and so on, but it doesn't have a, a, a long established tradition of reformist parties and trade unions and so on. It's a fresh working class. Many of them are first generation migrants from the countryside into the cities. They're working in conditions of high exploitation. And as I'm describing this, some of you might be thinking this is the same thing or similar parallels between this and what happened in Russia in 1917. Or what happened in Spain in 1970? Or what happened in Brazil in 1980? Uh, a first generation working class under conditions of dictatorship where there's no uh, avenues for legal trade union uh, or political uh, development. 
uh, in conditions of high exploitation, where the conditions have changed very quickly over a short period of time. And this leads to what? A revolutionary uh, explosion. And this is what's being prepared in China. And our task is to link up with the Chinese uh, working class and uh, to fight together to, to overthrow imperialism and capitalism around the world. No, not, to, not to celebrate that now there are more imperialist countries and the world is more multipolar, but rather to uh, strengthen our resolve to fight against capitalism and imperialism, uh, which, which are the main source of, uh, of uh, wars and exploitation, a system that has already outlived any useful uh, role that they might have uh, played in the past. <laughs>